Good afternoon. It's really such a thrill to welcome you to this historic gathering of our esteemed current and former U.S. Surgeons General here on our Dartmouth campus to discuss solutions to the mental health crisis. This is the only the second time in history that we've gathered all living current and former Surgeons Generals, and it's such an important topic to talk about mental health and wellness, and it's important to me as a leader in higher education. People often ask me why, and really the answer is simple. I've spent the last 20 years of my career exploring how stress impacts the brain and body, and it's very clear that in order for our students to succeed academically, they need to have appropriate health and wellness skills. How we feel is directly linked to how we perform, and it's our duty to help our students perform at their best. Our society depends on it. This is precisely why health and wellness is one of our top priorities here at Dartmouth, both in terms of expanding and supporting what happens on our campus, but also in terms of the work that we do that impacts the world. I'm so pleased that we've made significant progress on how we support our students and the work we're doing to support faculty and staff, but I know there's a lot more work to do. Partnering and pairing this with the work at Geisel School of Medicine and our partners Dartmouth Health in terms of developing the prescription digital therapeutics and the tools to support our healthcare professionals, Dartmouth really can have a strong impact on the world. That's really an exciting proposition. First and foremost today, I wanted to thank our frontline healthcare providers here at Geisel School of Medicine and Dartmouth Health for all the work they do every day deploying new treatments, technologies, and interventions to help our patients on a path to wellness. May I ask all of our healthcare providers to stand? Second, I want to thank all of our Surgeons General for being here over the last few days. This is, as I mentioned, a historic event, but what I think is so important are the small conversations you've had with student leaders across campus, hearing directly from our young people, the work they've done to support each other and to push our institution and others forward is just remarkable. To all of our government officials and public servants here with us today, I want to personally thank you for taking time out of your schedules to engage in this important conversation. I also want to acknowledge Cora Koop, partner of the late Dr. Everett Koop, 13th Surgeon General of the United States under President Reagan. Cora, it means so much to have you here today. Dr. Koop is among our most distinguished Dartmouth alumni, having graduated as a great member of the class of 1937. And there are so many people, both at Dartmouth and far beyond, who have been inspired by Dr. Koop to dedicate their lives to public health in the way he did, and for that we are so grateful. I'm quite certain that he would have been proud at this convening happening at his alma mater today. I also want to thank three outstanding leaders in our community who, without their deep commitment, this event would not have happened. First and foremost, Dr. Lisa McBride. Dr. McBride is the driving force behind bringing the Surgeons General here to campus today, and she's the Associate Dean for Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion at the Geisel School of Medicine. This, the second is Dean Duane Compton, Dean of the Geisel School of Medicine, whose leadership and commitment to all that we do here is, is so valuable. And finally, Joanne Conroy, President and CEO of Dartmouth Health. This 
high quality partnership is so important to what we do across the region and it's really thrilling for me to be able to partner with such an extraordinary leader. Thank you, Joy. And finally, I want to extend my deepest gratitude to all of our student mental health groups on campus, from the Student Mental Health Union to the Geisel Student Mental Health Charter Group and so many others for your continued advocacy and commitment to helping build a campus culture where mental health is not just openly discussed but effectively improved. Thank you. And finally, thank you to all of our former U.S. Surgeons General gathered here today and Vice Admiral Dr. Murthy, current and 21st Surgeon General of the United States for prioritizing this issue that is so important to our country and to the world. We are so grateful for your time, commitment, and service. And now it is my pleasure to introduce the moderator of today's discussion, a practicing neurosurgeon, associate professor, award-winning journalist, and best-selling author who has championed mental and physical wellness extensively through his shows, podcasts, and books on building and maintaining cognitive fitness and living longer, healthier lives. Please join me in welcoming CNN's chief medical correspondent, Dr. Sanjay Gupta. Thank you. I am I'm really delighted to be here. I jumped at the opportunity as soon as I heard about this. I think it's so important, uh, and I'm delighted all of you are here. Uh, as, a, as a doctor, as a reporter, I think this is really important, but mostly as a dad. I'm a dad of three teenage girls, and it is the very best part of my life. Um, part of that joy is from watching them grow but also sort of feeling like you have the knowledge and the ability to protect them as much as possible, to insulate them, to help them figure out what's best to eat, how best to move, how best to care for themselves, their school. But I think what I realize, as many people have, is that there are certain things in their world to which I was flying blind, um, especially when it came to their digital world. I had almost no vision on something that was taking up more and more of their time, if not most of their time. And when you add to that the sort of existential anxiety that I think our, our kids think about quite a bit, climate change, pandemic, conflicts, economic uncertainty. When I was a kid, I don't think I once ever contemplated the end of the world. But I hear from kids that they do think about that. That's something that's on their mind, the end of the world. So it's no surprise that the mental health crisis that president was just talking about is facing young Americans and that it is one of the most pressing national health issues of our time. And I got to tell you, you know, as a dad, I don't know how to necessarily protect them from all that. As hard as you try, you don't know. I think when it comes to this issue, we all need help from other parents, from educators, from grandparents, from scientists, and from this very eminent group from which we're going to hear today. So please welcome again the Surgeons General of the United States. I've, uh, I've been lucky and privileged to be able to spend time with all of them at various stages of my career. So let me just single them out for a second here as well. Dr. Antonio Novella, who was Surgeon General between 1990 and 1993. Uh, Dr. Jason Elders over there between 1993-1994. Uh, Jerome, Jerome Adams, 2017 to 2020. Dr. Regina Benjamin, 2009 to 2013. Dr. Morosugu, who is the Acting Surgeon General, 2002-2006. And of course, Dr. Vivek Murthy, 2014 to 2017. And 2021 to now, the Vice Admiral of the country as well. So thank you again for being here. You know, I, I, I just want to say that we're going to have a conversation today about mental health as, as doctors, but also, I think, for many of us as parents, as grandparents, but also as just fellow humans trying to navigate what is a new chapter of our collective experience. 
none of us have really gone through this before. So how do you deal with something that's unprecedented? We're going to talk about that. The Surgeons General, they are people who, who set out to figure out what ails America, and then they set out to fix it, and they have their sights set on mental health. So I'm really delighted to be a part of this conversation. Also, President Bylock, I just want to thank you. Um, your leadership is really important here. I watched your inaugural. To put this at the top of your five-point plan, I think that sends a message that hopefully the whole country will hear. So thank you for that as well. I'm really looking forward to this discussion. Before we start, Dr. David Satcher uh, could not join us today, but he did prepare this short video. So take a look at this, and then we'll get started. I released the first ever Surgeon General's report on mental health in 1999. My intention was that the report would usher in a healthy era of mind and body for the nation. The report recognizes the relationship between mental health and physical health and well-being, and the need to create a system of care that not only treats illness, but also promotes health. A balanced community health system balances health promotion, disease prevention, early detection, and universal access. This system concept would require a partnership between primary care and mental health. A balanced partnership provides an opportunity for the coordination and integration of patient care. Primary care providers must remember that they are not alone. The primary care provider is the quarterback of the healthcare team that collaboratively makes the system work. In the Surgeon General's report, Mental Health, we reported that stigma prevented individuals from acknowledging their mental health problems and thus prevented early diagnosis and treatment. Also, parents often neglect to seek care for their children due to embarrassment and fear that such a diagnosis might interfere with the child's future. We must acknowledge and find ways to overcome the barriers of stigma. We need to build public awareness regarding mental health and effective treatment. We must address the serious shortage of mental health providers. But we also must address the lack of training available for many community helpers who could potentially impact a person's health. We need to ensure the delivery of state-of-the-art treatment, which means moving frontline knowledge to frontline care, so that primary care providers have access to knowledge, technology, and teams of experts to support their work with their patients. We need to tailor treatment to age, to gender, to race, and to culture. We need to facilitate entry into treatment. We need to remove the financial barriers that create complexity and restrictions within our healthcare system. In order to eliminate disparities in health, we need leaders. Leaders who care enough, leaders who know enough, leaders who will do enough, and who are persistent enough until the job is done. I'm glad that we got here. All right. Can I just say, you guys look great, by the way. <laughs> I've, I've always loved the uniform. I think it's one of the best uniforms out there. Is that part of, part of the reason you take the job, I think, isn't it? <laughs> we have to be careful. And you guys don't get together very often, all together. It's kind of like the, twice. twice only. It's kind of like the Avengers getting together <laughs> to make a movie. But no, I'm really, I'm really honored uh, to be here. I, again, as I mentioned, I know all of you personally, and I'm really grateful for that. And I have tremendous respect for what you do and what the office represents, and I think what it potentially could accomplish, especially with regard to this issue. So I'm going to go ahead and kick off the discussion. Dr. Novell, 
First of all, I, I should point out you were my commencement speaker when I graduated from medical school back in 1993, <laughs> 30 years ago. You look the same, by the way. You really do. <laughs> it's great to see you. I, I wonder if you just want to react quickly to a couple of points Dr. Satcher made. He's, he was talking about some of the work he did in 1999, quarter century ago, talking about the stigma being a barrier to, to getting good care for mental health. 25 years later, where are we? Well, I think, um, I love my boss and this is why we tape him. There's no way that we could keep him away from this when he was the first report on mental health in this United States of America. And he needed the respect and I hope he got it. So, I, <laughs> but, I also want to make sure to remind you that I am the first woman Surgeon General of the United States and you better get it. <laughs> So, the topic at heart is very, 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 very heavy, and this is why sometimes it's good to have this kind of conversation. I am very worried about the United States of America because there's a crisis in mental health. 29% of the people today will say that they have had a mental problem sometime in their life, and 41% of them only get treatment. So when you look into this, I have the feeling that we, the ones who are supposed to take care of you, have also a problem and no one is taking care of us. When I look into that, I realize that one out of every five of us have depression. Four out of every five of us have basically uh, uh, imposter syndrome, and 63% of us have burnout. Not because we're overloaded, but because the system where we work has taken away my pride, and therefore is very weak, and I just don't know the time, what am I going to do it? So when one of us has mental problems, when one of us basically is so afraid to tell that you have a mental issue, 41% of the doctors do not report it. 84% of the nurses decided that they are going to be overwhelmed, and so 100,000 of them left two years ago, and 610 are supposed to leave in the next five. And so when I look into that, I say we have a problem in this country because no matter how crazy I feel, I don't have people that want to see me. So 14 million of us knows that we need help, but we don't know where to go. We, don't, we cannot afford it, and sometimes we don't even have the time. 12 millions of us have idea, ideas of suicide, and doctors, one out of every, each one of us suicide every single day. And the nurses is 17 per 100,000, so we have a problem in this country with, I feel it, I'm dwindling the reason for which I came into medicine and somewhere along the way it's being taken away from me. So what happens? I see the patient that needs me, so I depersonalize, I dissociate so that I can deal with the problem at hand that I cannot help you. And on top of that, I make sure that my empathy is diminished and my cynicism comes up. So what happens? I am called unprofessional. But did you know that 37 states in this country will ask me if I have a mental problem in my recertification and in my license, so I am never going to tell you that I have a problem, afraid that I'm going to lose my job, and afraid of the stigma, not only me, but the institution and my peer. And on top of that, I have violence in the system. I get kicked, I get spit, I get pushed, not only by patients, but also by, by the family members, and three of our people have already been mm. killed by homicide. So violence in the field is really killing the ability for me to practice medicine without fear. And in that sense, there are only 150 people to take care of you per region. And HRSA has says we have at least 5,008 places in where 150 million people live and there's no one to see them. And God forbid that you live in a rural area, at least one of 850 only have someone that can follow them. So we have a problem. At this moment, I believe that in medicine, the vulnerabilities are looked upon as liabilities and the system where we work is not taking care of us. If we're going to help you, then you have to help us. And in that sense, one of every five doctors have depression. One of every three is going to cut their practice hours. 32% are going to sell their offices. 54% say that they are not going to tell their children to become doctors. 32% will never go and choose medicine again if they have an opportunity to do it in their lifetime. And when you look into that, then tell me, there is a crisis to help you. I beg you to help us. Thank you very much. Thank you. You, 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 raised, you raised several points, and we're going to come back to some of those points. But let me just set the table a little bit more. Uh, Dr. Elders, 
One thing that came up as we were starting to prepare for this, this, this particular topic is this belief that today's youth are increasingly unprepared for the realities of the world once they leave a college campus. I'm just curious, this is something you've talked about, but how, how well do you think our youth are prepared for real life after college? Well, you know, I, I've always been very concerned about our youth and young people, and I've always, and I've wanted to, them all to grow up healthy, educated, and to have hope for the future. I feel that we are not doing as good a job as we could. And a lot of that is related to the mental health. You know, they, they've had problems, and we've known, now we've, we've known that they've had problems since they were sometimes 10 to 14 years of age. They enter, enter college, and I'm very pleased with the wonderful work that you're doing here at Dartmouth to really address some of the mental illnesses that our young people are facing here in college uh, and, and getting them involved. I met, had the opportunity of meeting and visiting with some of them yesterday, yesterday and, I'm, and I'm very proud about that. And I think more and more colleges are working to get more involved and to do more than we're doing. But we are not preparing our young people. And when we talk about the ones that are in college, come to college, well, we know that most young people, maybe most of the young people of the parents in this room come to college, but most of the young people in this country do not go to college. And so that's a real issue, a real problem. So we've got to move it down below college and we've got to begin to address some of these issues in, how to, in high, high school or even before as we know that, what, 20 plus percent of them have diagnosable mental health problems even before, at four, by 14, and up to 60 to 70 percent by the age of 24. I, as part of this discussion today, because we have President Bylock here and leadership of the university, I'm, I'm hoping we can get to as many actionables as possible, things that we can say that, you know, based on experience might, might be helpful. Do, Dr. Benjamin, you know, we're sort of seeing a trajectory over time. We heard from Dr. Satcher, you heard from Dr. Novella, you were Surgeon General, uh, what year was that, 2009, 2010 time frame? Yes. What, how much were you talking about mental health at that point? So we were talking about it quite a bit. Um, before I go into that, I just want to say you have to be careful what you say. Dr. Satcher was my community medicine pre, um, professor, and I told him I really like that uniform. <laughs> so, <laughs> and it was like, so be careful what you say. And the other part I, I just wanted to say is that um, it, it's really um, good to be back here, and, but it's sort of emotional for me because when I was here, we would do the MBA, MD program, and I got an honorary degree, but I always had Dr. Coop here, and he was my mentor. And it just, I know he's, his presence is here because I feel it, but this is the first time I've been on campus without him physically being here, so I wanted to say that. But we've been, um, we were doing mental health and behavioral health and always trying to follow, you know, in other, my previous SGs who had done reports. My biggest report was on the National Prevention Strategy. And in the National Prevention Strategy, we basically, prevention is a thing. And we have to go where people are if we're going to treat them. Um, Health does not occur in the doctor's office, in the hospitals alone. It occurs where we live, where we learn, where we work, where we play, where we pray, everything that we do. And so we have to take our health care where people are, and that includes on campuses. Um, one of the reports that I released was the um, suicide prevention um, strategy, national strategy for suicide prevention. At that time, um, 150 people were dying of suicide every day and it hadn't gotten any better. That's a small regional jet going down. So the problems are still here. Um, I was, there are solutions though. I'm a positive person, so I want to talk about what we do at some point. Um, one of the things I did last week was 
I'm on the board of Tulane University, and the Tulane students have a mentor program similar to what you have here, the students have here. The students are going to be the answer. They, um, they have this mentorship program. They get certified in how to um, be a mentor to incoming freshmen and transfer students who the first, when they first come, first six months on campus. And you just see what they have a cadence. They're dealing with staying in touch with these students. And the stories that they tell are just so amazing. And I'm sure our students here at Dartmouth who has a similar program is doing the same thing. The other thing is that we, you're going to hear a lot of statistics about how, how bad things are, um, but um, in, I guess it was 2020 or so, I worked with the um, Bipartisan Center to release a report on the integration of primary care and behavioral health. We, our current system does not have the capacity to deal with the surges that we have, and so how do we deal with it? Well, first we need more students going into the pipeline, so that's a given. But then what do we do now? We need to bring the body and the brain back together and bring them in, into the primary care offices, train and give resources to our primary care physicians so that um, they have those tools. They can see the moderately and the mildly um, behavioral health problems, freeing up the system to, for the severely mentally ill to go to mental health systems. <clears throat> and, but that's going to take a lot of work, and we can talk about the, the way it's going to take, you know, policy changes and all those things. But that would be a place that we have in place right now. In my little clinic, I can have behavioral health um, workers and, and a system to be able to reach, and we can at least start to address this problem. And the last thing is that, you know, digital health really helps putting health in people's hands but I could go on and I'll stop. Well, we'll, we'll come back to the technology piece of this because a lot of technology has changed even since you were Surgeon General. So both opportunities and potential pitfalls, but we'll, we'll talk about those. Dr. Murthy, um, my friend, it's good to see you. I, 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 um, I'm a, you, you've really tackled this issue and you know, before this even, you talked a lot about loneliness and loneliness being such a, a toxic sort of thing in our society. Um, how, how, why did this become of such interest to you, these topics? I mean, you think of the Surgeon's General Office, you think of tobacco, obviously, Dr. Coop, you think of opioids lately, things like that. Loneliness and, and mental health, when did this become such a big topic for you? Well, thanks for asking, and I'll just say first how happy I am to be here. It's my very first time to Dartmouth. What an incredibly warm and welcoming community here. And since we're all actually sharing some stories about Dr. Satcher. I'll just tell you, when I was in medical school, I still remember Dr. Satcher coming to visit and standing up when he entered in through the door, this stately man in a uniform with his just you know, incredibly standout, like white beard, and he looked so regal. And I always remember that image of him, but never thought I'd have the privilege to uh, you know, wear this uniform and serve alongside these extraordinary uh, human beings. So it is the uniform. I'm just, that's the message. <laughs> but it catches your eye. No, but I think for all of us, the motivation was, was obviously much deeper. But, uh, but and I'll just say one funny thing about Sunday. I was in the grocery store the other day. And, uh, you know, it's every now and then, uh, you know, it's, I think part of it is part of our job. Sometimes we get recognized by folks and they'll come up, they might want to talk to us. And there was this person who I sensed was following me around the grocery store. And uh, I was just doing my thing. And finally, at one point, he, summoned the courage to come up to me and he tapped me on the shoulder and he said i'm so sorry to bother you but i'm just so thrilled to meet sanjay gupta <laughs> oh man <laughs> I, there's so many so, things i want to say but I... <laughs> and most of them would be appropriate but yeah i'm sure <laughs> But anyhow, all that just to say what an honor it is to be here. These issues, <laughs> but the real, the real reason I'm, I'm actually really excited we're here is because it's not that often, yes, that we come together, but also not that often that we come together to pinpoint one particular issue that's of great concern to the public. And the issue of mental health really has become a national concern, not just a national health concern, but it's become an economic concern. It's become a national security concern. Uh, it is fundamentally impacting the fabric of society. And the reason that I wanted to focus on mental health during my tenure as Surgeon General and that loneliness in particular became an area of focus for me was not because I had this big grand plan. 
It's not like when I was preparing for my Senate confirmation hearing, I said, ah, boom, mental health. That's what it's going to be when I was, started my first stint as SG. It was because I was really taught by people I met around the country <coughs> that this was a pressing issue. And with loneliness in particular, you've heard a lot of the stats around mental health, so I won't repeat them. But with loneliness, what I found very interesting is when I would travel to small towns, big cities, uh, I would you know, and ask people just, you know, what is going on in your life? How can I be helpful? I would hear stories that you would expect, you know, about families that were dealing, struggling with the addiction crisis, who were worried about obesity and heart disease, who were worried about rates of cancer. But then I would often hear, surprisingly, these stories of people saying, you know, I, I just feel like invisible. I feel like if I disappear tomorrow, nobody would really care. And I remember a college student that I met in Texas, actually at UT Austin, uh, who said uh, to me, you know, I'm surrounded by thousands of other kids on campus here, but I don't feel like any of them really know me. Mm. And I don't really feel like I can be myself. Um, I remember giving a talk in DC once and having uh, a woman uh, come up to me at the end and say, you know, <clears throat> I, I want to thank you for talking or opening the door to the subject of loneliness because my husband has struggled for years with loneliness. I'm the only one he confides in. He doesn't really have any other friends. Uh, and I just don't know what to do. So that's when I started digging more into it. And I realized two critical things. One is that loneliness was extraordinarily common in the advisory that we issued, the Surgeon General's Advisory on Loneliness in May. Uh, we noted that actually one in two adults in America report measurable levels of loneliness, but the numbers are actually much higher among young people. So it's, this is extraordinarily common. And by the way, it's, this is a global phenomenon. It's not the US alone. But the second thing I realized was how consequential it was. Uh, with people, you know, we realize that people who struggle with loneliness and isolation, their risk of mental illness goes up, of depression, of anxiety, of suicide. But the surprising thing is their risk of physical ailments go up too, with an increased risk for cardiovascular disease by 29%, 50% increase in the risk of dementia among older people, an increase in the risk of premature death. So, and there are reasons for that that we can talk about. Uh, they have fundamentally to do with the fact that we evolved over thousands of years to be connected with one another. We found safety, we found relief, we found support in each other. And that's important to underscore because it is only relatively recently in cultural history mm -hmm. that we have come upon this notion that somehow being successful means being independent. And being independent means you don't need anyone else. You shouldn't have to lean on someone, and you don't show your emotions, you never show your weakness. But I'll just say that that is counter to thousands of years of evolution, right? The people thousands of years ago when we were hunters and gatherers who said, you know what, I'm independent. I don't need anyone. I don't have to you know, rely on someone for anything. You know what happened to that person? <laughs> they got eaten by a predator right? <laughs> or they starved because then they didn't have enough food, right? It was the people who built trusted relationships and leaned on each other who realized that our strength was in interdependence. Those are the ones who thrived. And I think we have gotten far away from that, a combination of cultural shifts, technology that has actually given us great convenience in our life, but which also means we don't have to go to the grocery store anymore, or the post office, or the retail store. We can get everything that comes to us. Uh, and a combination of also how we're using social media, how it's impacted our dialogue. All of these have come together to fundamentally change our connections with one another. It's happened over several decades. And it's happened right in front of our eyes, but I think we've taken for granted the fact that you know, our relationships or people are always going to be there, but we have become lonelier and lonelier. And it's having an impact not only on our health as individuals, but the health of society. Like we, we find, and we detail this in the advisory, that communities that are more connected, they actually tend to be more economically prosperous. They tend to have lower rates of violence. They tend to be more resilient in the face of adversity like hurricanes or tornadoes. And when communities are more connected, they're also more protected against forces that would seek to divide and polarize them. And I worry, like I think many of us do, about the polarization and division that we have in our country. But the truth is, it's hard to hate people up close, right? When you, you, we all have a relative that we probably get together with at Thanksgiving or on Christmas holidays, right? Who we fundamentally disagree with politically, maybe. But if they were injured and in the hospital, we would show up. And if we were sick and we were in the hospital, they would show up too. Because there's something bigger than our politics. It's our relationship with one another. But when we don't have that relationship with neighbors, with parents in our kids' schools, with others in our community, it becomes much easier to demonize folks, to turn them against one another. So however you look at it, our connection to one another is a foundation on which we build a healthy society. As that foundation has crumbled and weakened, uh, we've seen that we're suffering across the board. And that's why 
I really believe that rebuilding social connection in America, rebuilding <clears throat> the social fabric of our country has to be a national priority. <clears throat> Dr. Uh, Carmona, you, you know, Dr. Murthy talks about this evolution and how we were dependent on each other. We were, there was these, this interdependence that led to success and that we've gotten away from that. That notwithstanding, do you see this moment in time as a linear trajectory that's just going to keep getting worse and worse? Or is this more of a pendulum swing, do you think, that what we're seeing right now? Well, since everybody got a chance to say something about our mentor, Surgeon General Coop. I, I, would, uh, I would like to just begin with what I didn't realize at the time as a young resident at University of California, San Francisco in about 1982-83 when he came to visit during the AIDS epidemic. And the nation was quite polarized at that time about those issues. And here was this guy that was bigger than life that came to talk to all of us and it was the old amphitheater at the old San Francisco General Hospital, which was dated back to the 1880s, 1890s. And he had such a commanding presence and extraordinary gravitas. And what he said was, again, we're in San Francisco. This is the epicenter of AIDS before we knew anything. And he was being harassed politically. He was being told what to say. He had politicians stating that this was God's way of punishing gay people. Yet he stood up with a forceful message to the doctors, the residents, the interns there and said, I am the doctor of all people, straight, gay, Republican, Democrat, atheist, Jews. That's my job. And he said, by the way, this is an infectious disease. It has nothing to do with religion. And what it taught me was and as years went on, I recognized what he was telling me was about the integrity of this position. That's what's important because we've all, look at the diversity you see here, and we've all worked for conservative administrations and liberal administrations, but that's immaterial because we lead with science. And I, the lesson became more important many years later when I became Surgeon General, but again, it's about the integrity of the office because in a nation that's struggling now with who to believe, with mistruths, with half-truths, with poor information, we have to make sure that the public always can rely on what the Surgeon General says because it is apolitical, non-biased, and based on the best science. All the time. Yeah. Sanjay, um, you and I have worked together a lot, a lot. I'm the eternal optimist, and the pendulum does swing back and forth, but I do believe in the greatness of this country and the opportunities we have to move forward. When I look at the disease and economic burden that we have, which most of it is preventable, uh, you know, spending almost 20% of our GDP on what we call health care, it really isn't, it's sick, sick care, folks. 75 to 80 cents of every dollar is spent on chronic diseases that we self-impose mm. by poor behaviors, and then we lay the mental health challenges on top of that. And I'm, I'm going to digress just a little bit on mental health because, as you know, um, I'm a U.S. Army uh, Special Forces combat veteran. And uh, these things are not theoretical to me. They're very personal. Um, the fact that we have about 20 suicides a day of our veterans in this country, that's mental health as well. I have a son who served 21 years in the Army and has crippling PTSD. So I'm reminded every day of how difficult life is for these young men and women that come home. One of the challenges we have as it relates to the veteran population and, and the additional mental health burden that comes in is that we have a history of a culture of war. Do you know that since 1776, we've been involved in 106 conflicts with 12 major wars? In the 20th century, we spent 40 years at war of 100 years in that century. In the 21st century, we already have 20 years of war in the first 23 years of this century. So again, this is, an ap this is apolitical data, but
but for guys like Vivek, who isn't responsible now, looking at the proximate cause of a great part of our mental health challenges, not directly just our veterans, but what about the families? What about the moms and the dads that are home, the children that are worried? And what about those veterans who come home and have very difficult time reweaving into that fabric of society? When I came home from Vietnam, people spit at us. They called us names. At least now we've elevated and all realized that these young men and women, we have to separate from the political discourse that divides us in our nation. They did not make the decision to send us into harm's way. It is the people that we elected that made that decision, and we just become one of the pawns of war to carry out what those elected officials tell us. So the importance of that for me is that it's a segment of our society that serve selflessly, that put themselves in harm's way to preserve this very democracy that is an ongoing experiment for over two centuries, centuries now. And so my message is, uh, Sanjay, um, I have great optimism that we'll get there. As Surgeon Generals, in fact, I was talking with some of the students today, and I love, Madam President, thank you. It's, it's been an, a wonderful experience. And they asked me, Surgeon General, what is the biggest problem you're worried about today? And I think I surprised them because I said, I think my colleagues, Surgeon Generals, would be high on this too. And they asked me, what should we be doing? I said, well, I think the most important thing that we need to deal with today, notwithstanding mental health, is make sure we preserve our democracy because it's being tested right now. And I, 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 told those young, I told those young men and women who had their white coats on, I said, you are our future. I'm here, my colleagues are here, because we want to give you all the information, the mistakes we made, the successes we've had, because the burden of going f forward with mental health, as well as physical health, is in your laps now for the rest of your life. So all of us, I, I know I speak for, that we consider it such a privilege that we all feel once a Surgeon General, always a Surgeon General. We are part of Vivek's army now, and we back them up on everything and do whatever we need to do to get the message out to do this transformational stuff. So as far as the, back to the mental health, I mean, which again, I, I, um, it's very near and dear to my heart as well. Let's look at what happens with the Veterans Administration, but which by the way, is the largest funder of medical education in the country. They are an extraordinary organization, but they're often underfunded. And when we plan for wars, there's a budget for bombs and bullets and tanks and planes and bombs. But what we all know now is that when the ceasefire occurs, the war goes on and the silent wounds of war for all of those men and women who serve in uniform. Yep. There are colleagues of mine from Vietnam 50 years ago that are still in VA hospitals with mental health and physical problems. Yet there was nobody budgeting for that when they sent our most precious asset downrange, our young men and women. We have to do a better job when we feel that it's necessary for us to intervene. There should be some legislation that carries with support for the VA to prepare for years, maybe decades, of needs of mental and physical health for our veterans. They deserve that. And we st I need to start thinking of it better in our planning, which includes the mental health, because right now, think about shell shock, battle fatigue, those are the terms used in the last century. Now we have PTSD, we have a greater understanding of the neuroplasticity of the brain and what goes on, but we're still lagging behind in the services in a timely fashion for our veterans. Yeah. So I raise the bar for all of you, talk to your legislators, make sure they understand the importance. You've got a nice VA facility right up here in New Hampshire, it's extraordinary. We gotta step up and, and provide those services for our veterans because they're still struggling and we need to get them reassimilated into society so that they can become active members of our society once again. Thank you very much. Thank you, Rich. <laughs> just, just real quick, how is your son doing? He struggles every day. Uh, I didn't he, know this about he's, your- Yeah, well, we, I don't, I, you know, I usually don't tell anybody. Um, it, it, he got real sick when I was Surgeon General, and there's a whole story I can tell you about that. When 
when he came home and my, my daughter found him in our house because on active duty I was in Washington and she couldn't find my son. And, and she called me, she said, Dad, I, I don't know where he is. I said, well, look at the house. Maybe he went to our house, nobody's there. And I happened to be in the West Wing that day in a secure briefing and they were trying to call me, but well, we have to put our phones in the metal box and you can't get a call. So if she finds him in the house in a catatonic state in the corner and was uh, there for two days. And, she, and she's a nurse, she's a critical care nurse. And uh, she said, he keeps screaming, incoming, incoming. So uh, my aide and our office manager found out and they called, they called her. They said, call, call the VA. So she calls the VA, my daughter, who's a nurse, and the VA said, oh, he's still on active duty. We can't take care of him. And we started to see the cracks in the system. And um, so then, uh, of course, my uh, aide called Secretary Principi, who said, that's outrageous, it's the VA secretary. And of course, when he showed up in the emergency room at the VA, all the chiefs of services were there, the head of the hospital and everything. But the question I had with my colleagues, the Army, Navy, and Air Force Surgeon General was, what happens if that, that soldier's father is not the Surgeon General? Mm -hmm. yep. Our system is failing these young men and women. So, you know, he's out a few years now, uh, been hospitalized a number of times. As most of the kids, the stigma of mental health, you don't, I'm, I'm fine, I don't have to go, I feel good. Mm -hmm. But yet they digress into depression again. So that's why I mean it's personal to me because I see it every day and he is really the embodiment of thousands and thousands and thousands of these young men and women that are trying to reassimilate, who get pulled off, you know, the, the college team or a high school team, and they graduate and they're playing ball, and all of a sudden they become soldiers. And then after the most horrific things in the world that they experience, we expect them to come back and just hang out with us again. And, and that's the problem, you know. Um, he, he can't, when he drives, he can't drive on a rural road anymore because it's like Iraq. He has a couple of combat tours. My wife was the one that told me they went out on a, on a ride one day to go see my son up in, up in the Phoenix area and have to drive through rural Arizona. She said he started shaking as they were going. And we found out he's looking for an IED in the road. So, it's, it's, so that's why I'm so passionate about it because, I mean, all of us are, but I mean, I live it every day because I see him and, I, and through him I see thousands of others that we need to do a better job for. So thank you for the question, Sanjay. <laughs> I didn't, I, didn't, I didn't know that, Rich. Thank you for sharing that. I think, I don't know, I think it goes a long way. Just, I mean, you're, you're, you're talking about it. So I want, I want, I want yeah. Regina to, to weigh in here, please. I want to say thank you for sharing that with us as well. I, I mean, it's, we really appreciate that. But I was really pleased yesterday to see that the current secretary of the VA just announced a, a program for suicide prevention mm -hmm. at the VA and the 988 call-in line. So it, somebody's been listening to some of our reports and hopefully listening to you. That's, Dr. Adams, I, I wanna hear whatever opening thoughts you might have or react to what you've been hearing, but you know, the, point, the point that keeps getting made, I think in some way, shape, or form, is that we care about this issue, but does it translate to enough care within the VA system, as, as Dr. Carmona was talking about? Does it translate to enough resources in communities? Is there enough being done? You, you hear the stats, but I wanna hear just any opening thoughts you have, but this idea that we're, how do we get over that inflection point? We care, and we can keep talking about how much we care, but what are we gonna do about it? What do we do about it? No, no that, that's fantastic, and as uh, Dr. Novella mentioned earlier, these are heavy conversations, these are heavy conversations, so. I'm gonna really quickly tell you all my uh, Coop and Satcher story to lighten <laughs> things up a little bit. Um, I am the only former SG up here who didn't get a chance to meet Dr. Coop, but I had a beard most of my life. My kids had never seen me without a beard when I came, became SG. <clears throat> so they said, you have to shave your beard off. And the challenge with me shaving my beard off is I look like I'm 25 years old <laughs> when I shave my beard off, but they said, you've got to shave your beard off. And I said, well, Dr. Coop had a beard. And they said, well, you're not Dr. Coop. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, the, the other person to, uh, to have a beard was Dr. Satcher. 
And uh, I'm very proud to be just the second African-American male to serve as Surgeon General, uh, particularly in light of the fact that fewer black males are graduating from medical school now than they were 40 years ago. Hmm. And uh, that matters to this conversation that we're having, Sanjay, because we know that suicides, highest rate of increase in suicides is in um, t teenage and young adult black males. We know that opioid overdoses, highest rate of overdoses is in black and brown communities of increase in overdoses. And the CDC just put out a report uh, two weeks ago saying that we broke yet another record, 111,000 overdose deaths um, in the last year. And so the comment that I want to make to people, uh, and many of you all know that uh, prior to this whole COVID thing, uh, I really did try to lean into substance misuse. Um, we often separate substance misuse from mental health, from a regulatory standpoint, from an educational standpoint, from a payment standpoint, but they're really um, parts on the spectrum. And practical advice, um, we need to understand that mental health is a spectrum. So when we talk about mental health, too often what we're really talking about is mental illness. We're not really talking about mental health. And I have three teenagers, just like you do, and uh, I have this conversation with my kids. I had a con this conversation with my son. He's, he's 17, he likes to work out. And I go, you go to the gym to get stronger. You don't go to the gym because you're hurting. It's the same thing for mental health. We need young people to understand that we can do things like meditation. We can do things like um, making sure we have peer groups that we can connect with that will build our resilience, build up our mental muscles so that we can be stronger moving forward. And so I think that's important that we help people understand that, yes, there are bad stats, and we want to recognize mental illness. We want to recognize when people have problems. But we also very much want to um, recognize that there are things that we can do to make ourselves stronger and to build resilience in collegiate communities. I'm at Purdue University right now, and uh, we are working on trying to create recovery-friendly campuses with the knowledge that many people now do have a diagnosed substance use disorder, and colleges aren't very friendly places for them to be when you're trying to uh, stay sober. And so I mentioned substance misuse. One of the first things I did when I was Surgeon General was put out an naloxone advisory, calling on more Americans to know about and carry naloxone and opioid overdose reversal agent, because at the time, that was the epidemic that was plaguing our nation, a person dying of an opioid overdose every 11 minutes. And this is something that's very personal to me. Uh, many of you all know my story, because with his permission, I've shared it quite a bit. While I was in the White House, my brother was in a prison cell 25 miles away in Jessup, Maryland, due to crimes he had committed to support um, his addiction. And uh, uh, again, I feel exactly the same way that you feel. I'm Surgeon General of the United States, right. and there's nothing I can do right. to help my own brother who's struggling with addiction. He just got a released from prison two weeks ago. Um, he's in rehab right now, but he's in a rural community where there's not a lot of access. And I hope we do get to come back to technology and some of the ways that we might be able to increase access to uh, communities. There was a 7,000% increase in telehealth during the pandemic. And most of that was in the mental health arena. So there are some positives that we, can, uh, th that we can take out of this. But I put out the naloxone advisory. I put out an advisory about youth e-cigarette use. Why? Why does that matter? The young people here will tell you. At Purdue, the young people tell me that over 50% of individuals on the campus are vaping right now. Over 50%. Well, why does that matter? We know that these are devices that are designed to be perfectly addictive. They're designed to start you on this pathway. They're designed to hit those dopamine receptors and to create uh, this, this, this feeling that you aren't going to be able to get anywhere else. And, uh, and so that's something that you young people need to know in the audience, that, that these are not harmless devices. These are unfortunately um, new, newly designed devices that are, that are putting far too many people on the pathway to addiction. I put out an advisory calling on pregnant women and young people to, to know about the dangers of marijuana. And I was in New York City yesterday. Um, anyone been to New York City recently? I swear that if you tested me, I'd be positive for marijuana right now <laughs> because of the secondhand, the, the, the secondhand smoke. I mean, walking through Times Square. But what I try to help people understand is regardless of how you feel about adult use, 
no young person, no pregnant woman should be using these marijuana products. And I just want to very quickly, and I, I don't want to go on, but I want you to take a look at this glass of water. If this was filled with light beer, and I were to chug it on stage right now, would I be legally drunk? Probably not. Light beer, about 4.5% alcohol. If I were to fill that same glass with grain alcohol and chug it, would any of you all drive around Hanover with me? You'd be dead. That is the difference between the THC content of marijuana from when I was growing up, the Cheech and Chong days, about 4.5% 4, 4 to marijuana now when they take these new potent forms and they uh, actually vape it, you can get 80, 90% THC. And so we're seeing psychosis from people now who are vaping marijuana. And, and to, to, to bring it full circle, um, we have this chicken and the egg phenomenon where people are, are causing mental health disorders because of substance misuse. Um, we know opioid misuse cause, can cause depression. But we also know that in many cases, people are self-medicating their pain away because we don't have enough resources out there to treat their addiction, to treat their anxiety, and so they turn to substances. And so we have to really look at this entire spectrum and ask ourselves, how can we build resilience? Where do the gaps exist along the way that we can fill in with treatment, with community supports, um, and, and uh, by helping them understand the dangers of substances so that we actually uh, can, can move in the right direction. And I think for the, the, the Surgeons General that you have up here, we all leaned into this in different ways, and no one of those ways is going to solve the problem. But all of us working together along that spectrum is what it's going to take for us to, uh, to really put our young people in a position that they deserve to be in. I said this yesterday at a talk in New York City. Um, I was at the United Nations. Um, and as a parent, the one thing, the one thing you're supposed to do as a parent is leave your children a better world than the world that was handed to you. Well, when you look at life expectancy right now, we're not doing that as parents. We are failing our children. And I have to look at my three teenagers every day and know that I'm not handing them a better world than the world that was left to me. And a lot of that is because of our failure to really focus on mental health and to t do the hard things that it's going to take to uh, actually um, overcome this mental health crisis that we're in. Thank you, Dr. Adams. Dr. Mor Morrisu, let, let me pick up on that last point with you, and I want to let you make any opening remarks you might have or <laughs> react to what's been said so far. But this point that Jerome brings up about life expectancy, it, it's, it's an interesting thing because I think um, 100 years from now, if you look at societies, you'll say, what were the metrics by which we measure their success? And one of the things is life expectancy. And we're a country that spends $4 trillion on health care. And even before the pandemic, life expectancy was actually decreasing. Was and we were the only developed country in the world where that was happening. Mm -hmm. Top three causes of premature death were suicide, cirrhosis, typically due to alcoholism, and opioid overdoses, as Jerome just mentioned. Why, why here? Why here in the United States? I don't know if you know the answer to that, and I'm not trying to put you on the spot, but something is happening in America, because this isn't happening everywhere. It's not great in other places, but this is uniquely bad here. And I'm just wondering, how do you react to that? Yeah. Well, if I can start uh, with a couple of observations. Um, being the cleanup batter here amongst all of us, um, I, I, I wanted to, to, to share with you a meta message that I trust all of you have gotten because we represent here decades of surgeons general. Um, each one of us individual, each one of us bringing a different perspective. But I think one thing that we all do is we have a consistency in terms of the arc that we are taking. We're all focused on the science and the evidence and dedicated to improving the health and the well-being of our nation. Um, we, we've talked about uh, Dr. Satcher when he re released in the year 1999 the first ever Surgeon General's report on mental health. Many people may not even realize that in that same year, he issued a call to action to prevent suicide. Mm -hmm. In addition to that, as we have 
looked at the arc of time. Uh, Sanjay, you asked, well, how can we actually do something about it? Well, my approach would really be to apply the principles of public health to the whole problem. Number one, we need to improve the awareness of the American public to an issue. And one of the major aspects, one of the major powers that we have is that of the bully pulpit. C. Everett Koop, Dr. Koop, who, again, you can't go, go through this without uh, mentioning uh, Chick, um, was the epitome of that bully pulpit. And each one of us individually has that opportunity to communicate a very, very clear and science and evidence-based message regarding that. So number one is improving the awareness of our population, of our society, to the issues of mental health. And again, back in 1999, the first ever Surgeon's General, Surgeon General's Report on Mental Health. At the same time, we need to be remembering that when we look at data, data can be aggregated, but we also need to disaggregate data to really focus in on reasonable solutions for this or this or that population. Sanjay, you mentioned the leading causes of death. Well, um, the leading causes of death, suicide, ranks 11th in terms of the leading causes of death. Yeah, and just to be clear, these are leading cause of premature death. Right, I understand, yeah. Um, but if you start slicing and dicing that, the leading, the second leading cause of death among people between the ages of 10 and 19 is suicide. The third leading cause of death between ages 20 to 35 is suicide. And so suicide is the unfortunate endpoint of mental health, mental disorder, mental disease, calling out for help. And so my perspective is we need to take data, but not be, not be married to the, the, the aggregate data, but also to disaggregate data to really begin to focus on where problems are as well as where we can intervene. Once we are able to identify what the issues are and improve the awareness of the general public, then it's our responsibility to go behind that and figure out what are the leading, what, what are the underlying <coughs> causes of that. And having identified the underlying causes, de defining how we can prevent or intervene to be able to actually address and improve that issue. And so when we talk about national policy, we're talking about national policy. But ultimately, national policy has got to be brought down into state-level data, into community-level data, and ultimately into data that addresses each and every one of us individually. Because each and every one of us is an individual and community health is individual health and individual health is community health. Thank you, thank you. I, I, I am gonna come back to this, this point again. We don't have to do it right now, but I'm gonna come back to this point again about what is unique about America. I, I, I'm curious, and I don't know if there's an answer, but I would like to get your perspectives. But moving on to more of the solutions part of this discussion, Dr. Novella, I, I don't know if you talked to Dr. Murthy on the side, he's the acting, I mean, he's the current Surgeon General. Do, if you were to give advice on what to do about this at this point, with all that you know, all that you've experienced, what would you say? Part of this is, again, under, making people understand how the gravity of the situation, but the mechanics of what to do about it. What would you say? You talking to me? Well, you have an hour. <laughs> <laughs> the most important thing I want to talk about this moment is so many women are coming into medicine, 
and so many women are really trying to leave medicine. Six to ten years after they finish their specialty, they want to leave because they want to take care of their children and their home. And so when they want to come back to practice, it's very hard for them to reintegrate for the simple reason that they have to either repeat part of their boards, repeat part of the residency, and some of them have a partial license which does not allow them to be able to get into practice, charge money, and basically they are 69% of them have burnout. They have different circumstances that puts them at risk, and it's gender inequity, race inequity, and the comments that they get for their looks, for their sexual harassment, and for the overload that they have. And on top of that, they have six hours when they get home to be able to do ex the electronic medical records. They are just clamoring. I want to stay. I don't want to disappoint the women who are trying to come into medicine, but please make sure that you recognize my gender differences, remove them from the system, and more than anything, take an overload. So we have lost the self-care. We don't sleep, we don't eat, we don't do social interactions. And on top of that, we basically has a home, a husband and children to take care of. And when we see patients, we're better than you guys. <laughs> we're better than you guys. <laughs> we are better in the sense that we take longer to see the patient, I know their name, and then I do the electronic medical records when I get home. But on top of that, I do not have a patient readmitted, so my hospital doesn't have to pay the fine. So I say to the administrators, the money that you get by me making your hospital look good, give me a bonus for my character and take money to be, to be better. <laughs> Do, do, Dr. Adams, you, you, you uh, started alluding to this, te technological sort of solutions. Um, first of all, you know, again, are, are there, when you think about this, do you think that, that a Band-Aid is necessary given the acute nature of this, or is this a time when you can start to treat this more holistically? Are, where, where are we? Are we in crisis mode, or can we actually start to take a little bit of time to think about how you want to address well, this? Well, I, I think the answer to that question is both. And again, if you go back to substance use disorder, um, the Band-Aid was naloxone. You save the life that's in front of you that's about to be lost. But that doesn't fix the problem. You need the warm handoff to um, treatment and recovery and support services and communities that embrace that individual. Um, and so I think the answer is we've got to figure out how to do both. And so what's interesting is you said, what do we need to do? And I think Dr. Moritsugu um, hit on something that I don't want to be lost here we will not treat our way out of this problem. We put a lot of focus on more providers, more treatment, and we do need that. And we pay more. But from a public, and yes, yes, and we pay more. But from a public health standpoint, we know that only about 20% of what determines your overall health, mentally and physically, happens in a hospital or a clinic. The other 80% happens in communities that are connected that are supportive of women and minorities, that have childcare, that have good educational opportunities, that have a good paying job for folks. And I think we need to really focus on building those stronger communities. And each of us has done that in different ways. Do Dr. Murthy's really talked about loneliness and isolation. That crosses over, and, and you did a special a few weeks ago that I saw in Blue Zones. Yep. And we know that Blue Zones are the places where people are most likely to live past 100. And I've worked with Dan Butner. What was the secret sauce of Blue Zones? The secret sauce was connectivity. It was community. It was people coming together. And so what I did when I was Surgeon General was write a report called Community Health and Economic Prosperity, really helping businesses understand the negative impact of poor community health on their economic bottom line and why they needed to lean into creating healthier communities. So to Dr. Mercy's point, uh, businesses once upon a time used to fund the Little League, used to fund the theater, used to fund community parks. And then they pulled out in the 80s when the Business Roundtable actually said, no, that's a waste of our shareholder money. We need to start focusing on building the company value up. And the Business Roundtable in 2019 actually realized the fault of that logic and reversed and said, we need to look at stakeholder value, then COVID hit. And COVID showed us like nothing else could have how poor uh, communities that have poor health lead to economic problems. And I think we need to make that case because we need to rebuild our communities <clears throat> and our connectivity. And we need businesses behind us to help us do it. So I love the power of the SGs. 
and my other SGs may disagree with me here, but I'd rather have um, Mark Zuckerberg or Elon Musk or Jeff Bezos in front of Congress arguing for healthier communities than they have the Surgeon General of the United States, because we know that motivates legislators to put the funding in the right places and to do the things that are actually going to have to be done to create a community where mental health is a priority. There's, we have some, um, I'm going to sprinkle in some questions that we also got from some of the students that came in. Uh, and I'll stick with you, Dr. Adams, on this. As divisiveness in this country has grown, so has in concerns about mental health. Uh, what, what, can we, what can we do, all of us, to support students during what is expected to be a very volatile election season? Um, you work for President Trump. Mm -hmm. I mean, maybe you're somewhat uniquely qualified to answer this question. I don't know. But it, it, I, th I think it's a legitimate concern. I mean, I, again, Rich makes the point that there may be a pendulum swing here. I, I don't know where we are in the trajectory of this very important issue, but I think what we can say pretty reliably as that divisiveness grows, these issues become worse. So I'll be really quick here, but I love the question. One of my favorite quotes and one I share with young people whenever I talk to them is by Mark, Mark Twain. Mark Twain said, travel is fatal to prejudice, bigotry, and narrow-mindedness because you see the world through someone else's eyes. And I was very lucky despite growing up below the poverty line, to have opportunities to travel all over the, the United States and all over the world. I've lived in Boston, Massachusetts. I've lived in Laredo, Texas. And I can tell you they have very different mindsets about guns, about women's health, about drug policy, about any and everything that you can think of. But by living in both places, I met neighbors in both places. And I realized that at the end of the day, everyone truly does just want to do the right thing um, and, to, and to support their family and to live their life. And so to the young people, I really do think that if we're going to get through this, we have to resist the temptation to, to see hatred. And the media often wants to, wants to, to stir up that, that hatred and to frame things as binary. You have to resist that. And one of the ways that you can resist that is by traveling. I say to young people, travel as much as you can while you can so that you get to know what it's like. It, the United States is a big country and we like to brag about how diverse we are. Most of the people in the United States don't leave their little bubble ever. And it's really easy when you're in your little bubble to think those people in Texas are bad people, those people in Indiana are bad people, those people in Berkeley, California, where I've lived at, are bad people. Another quick funny story, um, I lived in Berkeley, California, um, and they thought I was a tea partier. And then I moved back to Indiana, and they thought I was a socialist. <laughs> and I was the same person in both places. <clears throat> but again, I had moved, and those people hadn't. You need to understand that, uh, that, that there's more that, that aligns us and that we share in common than what could ever separate us. One more quick doctor story, because I think this is a good one for the, for the students to hear. Um, I was in the operating room, and this is a, it's a story I have in my book. I was in the operating room one day. I'm an anesthesiologist, and um, I uh, had to put EKG pads on a, on a young man who needed surgery. And he had the sheet pulled up tight over his chest. And I g gently tried to pull it down to put his EKG pads on, and he didn't want to let it down. And I said, sir, um, do you mind if I pull down your sheet so I can put on these EKG pads? And I pulled it down, and he had Nazi swastikas tattooed all over him. And he had a black man who was about to have his life in his hands. And, and so, we pulled it down, we put on the EKG pads. I noticed he had um, a tattoo of, uh, of his child's name on him. And I could have reacted harshly, I could have reacted coldly. I said, oh, tell me about, tell, tell me about your, you know, your, your tattoo, is that your child? And we had a conversation about his kids. And you know what's interesting about that exchange is, had I reacted coldly and harshly, it would have fed into his stereotypes about people like me. And I have no illusions that I magically changed his, his mind, but you know, maybe that interaction showed him that not all black people are the way that he thinks of them as being. And that kindness I showed him, you know, maybe that did help shift him just a little bit. And I think if we can look at things that way instead of you need to hate this person because, because of what they said or who they are, or that, that, then I think you'll be in a, a much better situation and I think it will, it will spread positively throughout our country.
Uh, Dr. Elders, I, I'm, I'm just wondering, I, I want to get some of your top line thoughts here. By the way, you're 90 years old now, right? That's right. That's right. <laughs> Proud to be 90. Much of what ails us, as I was talking about, many of those things didn't exist uh, when you were a Surgeon General. That's correct. Um, social media, these devices, some of these things. And I'm not saying they're the only culprit here, but it's probably part of what we're talking about here. But sort of a similar question that I asked Dr. Carmona, where, where are we? How, how worried are you about this? Do you think that this is something that's going to self-correct? Or, or is this a trajectory just heading in the wrong direction? I don't, you know, I don't think it's going to self-correct the problem. You know, some of the problems we've been working on for hundreds of years. You know, it's the, when we go back and really read, you know, many of our problems related to black in the black communities and racial relations, that's not what we're about today. But you know, so many of them are very much like the LGBT. Uh, few communities, because I really, you know, I was a pediatric endocrinologist. I took care of those patients, the LBG, LBGTQ uh, pa patients before, you know, when nobody, you know, they didn't even have doctors, nobody. And, and, and I was having to go out and stand up, and, I, and maybe that's where I got some of my fight for them because when I, again, when doc, uh, my Dr. Coop story, well, well, I met a lot of them when uh, I, I first went to Washington as Surgeon General and we was talking about the, the problems we were having. And I remember the thing that gave me the most courage, that there was two young men who went and stood <laughs> on the senator's desk to, to real talk to them about the problem that, you know, they were LGBT. And, and I, of course, I didn't, I, I wasn't very smart then. And Dr. Cooper had always told me, stand up for what you believe is right. My mother had always told me, always do the right thing. And there's, see, and always, if you're doing what's right, even if you aren't the best in the world, always do your best and know that that's good enough. Well, after they came back and they were telling me what they'd done, well, I thought, well, if they can do that, I wasn't gonna go stand on the senator's desk. <laughs> but uh, I start thinking about the things I believed in for right young people like you. We were talking about college, more college students that I had, you know, I took care of lots of adolescents that had, you know, sexual disorders or who was, had diabetes or who other things that young people were going through. And I just, from, I just spent the rest of my life really wanting to make sure that I wanted to do the right thing for young people. Hmm. I wanted to make sure they grew up healthy. I wanted to, to be educated. I wanted to, to make sure that they had hope, you know, I wanted them to be healthy, educated, and motivated. And whatever they wanted to do, if they were motivated to do it, they could do it. You see, when I was growing up, what I was being educated to do was be a good maid. And I tell everybody now, I, you know, I had four hours. That's what they taught black girls in schools. Everybody had four hours of home economics every day. <laughs> five days a week. And I tell them right now, I say, I'm still the best maid I know. <laughs> <laughs> and and that's, I can't physically do the job. Physically, I may not be able to do the job, but I know how. <laughs> but but I'm, 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 I'm just saying that, the, that when you say things have changed, I thought, but, but the other thing is I always was telling young women, 
you know, everybody said, well, how did, why did, how did you become a doctor? What made you become a doctor? It was a young black woman who came to my college. And that was the first doctor I'd seen in my life. And they said, how could I have always wanted to be a doctor when I'd never seen a doctor? We didn't have mm -hmm. water, electricity. You know, we didn't have the, so we didn't have TV. So I couldn't, how could I have seen a doctor? And she talked about the difference, Dr. Edith Irby Jones. Mm -hmm. and, I, and she talked about the difference between the high roads and the low. I spent the rest of my life wanting to be just like Dr. <laughs> Jones. <laughs> and I tell people now, if you don't have a mentor, get one. Mm -hmm. yes, and if you don't have one, be one. Because you never know the real difference it, will, it can really make in your life. So I, so I think the young people in college now I think the reason why you are doing, of all of the whole society, are not doing as well, you know, as the same kind of progress have been made in your life span as earlier was really because we as parents Maybe I just talk about me and not talk about you. Talk about we as parents, but I think I'm. My, I don't think I'm being too. But we as parents feel that you know we want to take care. Sure, we have good maternal health. We want to take care of babies. I mean, oh, you know, just look at what we've done for infant mortality. Look at all the things we've done in regard to public health, and we real. But you know, the day our children graduate from high school, or we think they're grown and gone. <laughs> That's the biggest lie I ever told myself. <laughs> <laughs> because they may be grown, but they sure aren't gone. <laughs> but but, but we, are, we really not concentrated and thought about all the things and we're talking about mental health things. Yeah. You're in college of facing multiple kinds of mental health problems. For, first of all, in early adolescence and stuff, you, you know, you're, all the changes you're going through, the emotional changes, the hormonal changes, the physical changes. Then, you know, when you leave home, all the new friends, new environment, new teachers that, that you're going out meeting and the adjustment you're having to make. So it, it's a wonder. Goodness, it's a wonder you survive. But see, we as parents think, well, you're off in school and so you're doing wonder, wonderful. And I, and I think that and I'm, I'm, very, I'm really proud of you, young people. And I want you to know, I, I fought hard for, all, for young folk. Yeah. When I was doctoring earlier, both politically and I got beat on a lot. Oh. But I want you to know, I want you to take good care of me <laughs> <laughs> now that I've gotten to be 90. Because I want to get to be 100. So I'm depending on you. Thank you, uh, thank you, Dr. Alders. You just made me miss my daughter a lot. She's a freshman in college, so thank you for that. Please. Yeah. Sanjay, if I could, I'd like to get back to the question that you asked earlier uh, in terms of the upcoming election cycle and what we would recommend for students. Uh, I wish I had the magic bullet, the magic sauce, and I don't know whether my colleagues have that. Um, and uh, I, I just wanted to comment that um, this election cycle, even more so than previous election cycles, are going to be stressors, an extremely stressful period. Mm -hmm. And uh, when we start looking at communities, and here we're looking at a, an 
educational community, this is one area in which the administration, Madam President, may be able to provide outlets for further discussion. Um, I, I've always thought in terms of all society is ultimately reducible to the bell-shaped curve. You got most people in the middle, you got some people on the left, some people on the right. However, over the last few years, I've been concerned that our bell-shaped curve has been morphing into a bimodal curve. Mm -hmm. You got people here and people here, and there's a chasm in between, and that chasm continues to widen. I don't know what we can do to bring those two back together again. I think one of the issues that we're gonna be faced with is verifying information. Mm. And uh, my comment would be, apply the Reagan-Gorbachev doctrine. <laughs> Trust, but verify. <laughs> and uh, this is with regard to information that we share with each other as well as information that we get from media. And, and, and so, uh, as I said, I wish I had the magic bullet that could address this, other than anticipating that this is going to be an extremely big stressor and that we as a, an academic community and we as a nation have got to address this and try to find a potential solution for this. Yeah. No, I think it's a, it's, a, it's a fantastic point. I mean, you know, whether or not you agree with the source of content or not, do you trust it? Do you trust it to be accurate and authentic? You may not agree with it, but where are those loci, loci of truth anymore? I think they're increasingly hard to find. Please. Yeah, I wanted to go back. It's always hard to speak after Dr. Well, these two ladies, I should say, both, both my predecessors. But, um, but I want to go back to a question about why in the United States is different. Yeah, I did a thing with the economists and, and the world rankings and the United States ranks very low. We don't invest as much as other countries in primary care. We also don't invest as much in our social determinants of health. And then we have all of these political determinants of health. The, one thing I think is really different and very difficult kind of relates to what you're talking about is the lack of trust. We've lost trust mm -hmm. in everything. And, and I think some of that's intentional. I think there's things at play that, that make us want to distrust each other and distrust anything, any institution, churches, politics, whatever it is, I mean, trusting your neighbors. But we have to figure out a way to go back and, and establish that trust. And one of those trusts is in science and we have eroded that trust. Um, and so, Jerome, I, you're right. I'm one that don't agree with you about Zuckerberg in that <laughs> I think, I think it's, it's important that we have trustworthy people out there speaking with science to back that information up. Um, I think Mark Zuckerberg would be great to be a part of our team <laughs> and work with us, but I do think we need to stick to the science, stick to the to the information. There are a couple of other things. It was, the other is, um, I mentioned about integrating primary care and um, behavioral health. If a patient comes in my office to get their blood pressure checked and to get their cholesterol checked, checking their mental health or behavioral health is easy. They're comfortable with that. And it, it can be done there much easier than trying to have them go to. They said, I'm not going to no crazy house. I'm not going to go anyplace. So, so that's easier. And then the other thing we, were gonna, we didn't get a chance to talk, to, talk about was the digital and the, the technology. But there's so many innovations out there, so many innovative ideas, young um, entrepreneurs that are starting to address this, that we need to embrace it and support them as many ways as we can. And I actually completely agree with Dr. Benjamin, just so you know. That's why institutions no. such as Dartmouth are so incredibly important. We need that strong science foundation at the core. What I'm saying is that we as scientists and health officials need to reach out to and work with the business community so that they become our megaphones, our amplifiers, and so that they're informed in saying things that make sense because I completely agree with you. So one of the names I mentioned, uh, I, I would not want that individual uh, out there 
advocating for, for health issues, but I would love the opportunity to sit down with that individual and say, let's talk about the science. Let's make sure you're grounded because you have tremendous influence and we want you to use that influence for good. One more thing, I, was, I grew up through the AMA, all of you knew that, and so well, physicians are important, and we have an important role, but we can't do it by ourselves. Mm -hmm. We thought we have to, we do have yeah. to be at the table. Also went into government, and government says we can make a policy to change, improve every, or correct everything. We can't. Um, in the business world now, and everyone says, well, at the boardroom, at the board table, you can't do it by yourself. <coughs> and then when you get into investments and, and, and venture and, and private equity, they say you throw enough money at a problem, you can fix it. You can't. Yeah. You have to do it all together. We've all got to start to make a community and work it and we have, we have just, just a few minutes left, and I want to uh, ask a couple questions here, but first, Dr. Novella. We're talking about data, and I'm extremely worried that the system moves so fast for giving me results of medications and of diagnosis of patients. I'm a little bit worried of the use of artificial intelligence just to make my life faster. And for that reason, do remember that not every nationality or every race is included in the data gathering. Right. Mm -hmm. Second, remember that the ethics are a little bit low. Right. And third, remember that at this stage of the game is a wonderful instrument, but in the fastness of the system that we want to live, keep an eye on artificial intelligence as the only thing that can give you the hope of the future. It has flaws. Utilize well, you're going to be okay. But I also wanted to tell the students, if you want to really take care of mental health, you have to help the primary care physician, who is going to be the one basically seeing the first diagnosis that then will refer it to the psychiatrist. But of the 28,000 doctors that get graduated every single May, very few are primary care. And for me, that is the detective of medicine, the one that knows my name, the one who holds my hand, and the one who really cares about my family. So I want to see more primary care physicians coming from Dartmouth <laughs> at any time. And, that, and that, is a, that is a very specific actionable, I, you know, I mean, as we're sort of starting to conclude here before, uh, Dr. Murthy, I, I get to you. I'm wondering, Dr. Carmona, the Surgeon General's office, everyone knows the Surgeon General, but in terms of the mechanics of what you could do, what the office can do when it comes to addressing an issue like this, I wonder if you can educate us a little bit about this. How would you go about trying to make change in this area? I know that there's not policy teeth per se, but what are, what are the mechanics of the job here? Uh, you go. You, yeah. Oh, okay. Um, I, I think it's using the bully pulpit to your benefit. In other, in other words, um, we have an, an extraordinary privilege to be Surgeon Generals, and it's a position of trust in the American public, uh, as we've talked about with our colleague, uh, past uh, Surgeon General Coop who really set the bar high for all of us. And we always have to speak with the best science and the integrity and, and get out there. That like the issue that we just talking about um, with the um, issue of mistrust before us today. Uh, rather than look at it as just a metric, in fact, that mistrust breeds anxiety and further mental health problems because the public doesn't know who to trust. Think about everything that happened in COVID. You'd hear some politicians say one thing, the other one says something. We had somebody talking about drinking Clorox. Why didn't we do that before? You know, it make you better. I mean, it, it, and so people are watching the screen wondering, who do I believe? And, and I think that we, as Surgeon Generals and those who come after us, always have to understand the extraordinary privilege we have to be the truth tellers. Because often the challenge for us is telling inconvenient truths to politicians. But it's, they should be strong enough leaders to take the information and make the best decision rather than trying to co-opt any of us to say what they want politically because it's an expeditious way of accomplishing whatever it happens to be, re-election or fundraising and things like that. And I think that we need better elected officials that we trust that can do the job apolitically for the people and Surgeon Generals, as you've heard from all of my colleagues, always speaking truth to power, because that's what we need to move forward. I, you know, I, again, I just have to say, if there's one thing that I think I will really take away from this, is that 
we may not agree on things, but the idea that we can trust each other. Right. The, you know, I mean, look, to take it metaphorically, there's deep fakes out there, and they're really good. I mean, they're hard to tell. But if you had a watermark on the television screen and said, what you're watching is authentic. Right. Yeah. And, and that matters, even if you don't necessarily agree with it. Truth becomes the most important commodity yeah. and, and because it breeds a trust that you're, that you're talking about. I mentioned something that just reminded me, Sanjay, uh, uh, a dear friend of mine who passed a number of years ago, for those of you who are old enough, Walter Cronkite. And, and Walter and I, this, the summer before he, uh, he passed, we had a conversation and he had uh, been talking about media. And he said to me, uh, Richard, we really don't have news anymore. This is, you know, partisan discussion and he went into in depth. And I, and I started to think that when we had three networks, CBS, ABC, and NBC, and when we were kids, not you, you're a young guy, <laughs> but, but Walter Cronkite would come on on the 7 p.m. news on CBS, and he would tell you what happened. And it was never shaded left or right. He would say, here's what happened here, and here's what happened here, and he would finish the broadcast with, that's, that's the right. way it was. Right. Nobody ever yeah. questioned his integrity. They took the news because he reported clearly, like you do, Sanjay, quite frankly. Thank you. And, and, but now people don't even know what's news and what's fake information. And he said to me, the last thing I'll tell you, and I, unfortunately I didn't get to see him after this. He died shortly thereafter. But he said to me, one of the things I'm most proud about, that when I, and he, by the way, he had been a, sec, a World War II correspondent. I mean, had done media for decades. He said, one of the things I'm most proud about that when I die, people will not know if I was a Republican or a Democrat, because all I did was talk about the news. Yeah. <laughs> so, so, Dr. Murthy, um, I, think, I think this is going to be one of the issues for which you're going to be most known. I think when they read your Wikipedia page or whatever it is, you know, decades from now, this is going to be near the top, I think, loneliness, mental health, and what you've done here. So I really applaud you for that and taking this on. I do, I do we're, we're winding out of time here. I, I, I want to really hear from you on what you think society can do, but also, you know, look at this audience here. you got educators, you got students, you got people in the community who care deeply about this because they're here on a, you know, Thursday afternoon listening to you. What should they do? What's the message? Well, look, I think for a lot of us, this issue is very personal, uh, the issue of mental health and loneliness. And actually, just out of curiosity, how many here, just by a show of hands, know someone in your life who's struggled with their mental health or struggled with loneliness? <laughs> Everyone, right? And I think we should never lose sight of the personal nature of this. Sometimes in medicine, in the past, we were taught, you know, be objective when you're with patients, check your personal experiences at the door. I think what we realized since then is sometimes those personal experiences can be sources of strength. Sometimes they can help guide us. They can help fuel us in our care for patients. So one thing I think that's important for us to do is keep those people in our mind who are struggling because they become our sources of motivation but also empathy toward others. And if you think about the people in your life who you know are struggling, you also know that it's hard to tell from the outside mm -hmm. how they're doing. We have become professionals at putting on masks on and walking around society and making it seem like everything is going fine, like we don't need any help that there's nothing to see here. We do that in person, we do that on our social media feeds, but what it betrays is the reality of what's happening is that a lot of people are walking around suffering. So one thing that we can do is keep those people in, in our minds. The second thing that we can do uh, as a society is recognize that even though the problems that we've described here and the drivers of those problems are really profound and entrenched and structural in nature, that doesn't mean that we as individuals can't make a difference in the mental health and well-being of people around us. Because we have been designed to be social creatures, when I encounter somebody who even I don't know, but who's walking the other way down the street and who smiles at me, it actually changes how I feel. Mm -hmm. And I'm not unique to that. That's actually a human phenomenon that we see, right? When somebody, a friend calls you to check on you, just to say, hey, uh, nothing's going on. I just was thinking about you. I wanted to know how you were doing that makes you feel good. Many of you have, may have had the experience of walking into a meeting or being late for a class, you're rush, rushing and all of a sudden your phone rings and it's your mom or it's your friend or it's your brother or sister 
or your kid, and you're thinking to yourself, you know, I don't have time to pick this up right now because I'm busy. I'll just silence it and get back to them later when I have time. But I guarantee you, if you actually use that moment, just picked up the phone and said, hey, it's great to hear from you, but I, I can't talk now. Is it okay if I call you back later? It feels different just hearing their voice and them hearing yours, right? Small moments of human connection make a huge difference in how we feel and how the people around us feel. You know, as we think about the broader roles that we play, whether you're a student, whether you're an administrator, whether you're a leader in your community outside of Dartmouth, we have the ability to help shape and influence the environments in which we operate, our classes, uh, our workplaces. We can actually help create greater social connection in our workplaces. Our office has a way that we do this, and it doesn't take very much time, but once a week when we get together for our all staff meetings, we spend 10 minutes where we have one team member interview the other about their life. It's not about their current job, it's about the rest of their life. We learn about their hobbies, we learn about what their dreams were when they were kids, what they wanted to do. We learn about moments of hardship and disappointment. We come to see them as humans, and even that 10 minutes often helps us feel more closely connected to them than working with them for an entire year beforehand. There are things we can do in our workplaces, in our schools, to help build that connection and that community that we so desperately lack. But as I say this, look, if you look at this broader issue that we've been talking about, there, there are so many drivers, right? We've talked about many of them today. We've talked about technology, which can be a double-edged sword, uh, you know, especially social media, which can help sometimes, but can also hurt and separate and divide us, make us feel worse about our self-esteem. We've talked about the fact that we are living in an information environment also that is 24-7 and also is increasingly negative, right? And just out of curiosity, how many of you have had the experience of you know, flipping through your phone, looking at the news, and just feeling worse about the world and about your life, right? So, and that, that's not because we don't have you know, passionate, thoughtful um, you know, journalists who are grounded in the right values. I'm sitting next to one of those right now. Uh, but it happens because like, when I was growing up, if I wanted to turn off the flow of information in my life, I just turned off the TV. That was it. But now it's constant, it's coming to us all the time. So the combination of social media and its impact on our relationships and self-esteem, the constant negative environment, information environment that we're in, with the fact that life is changing, the pace of change is so rapid uh, right now, all of these have conspired along with loneliness to be a profound weight, a downward weight on our mental health and well-being. But I want to mention, lastly, the cultural piece of this as well. Because when we talk about levers that you can use to, to address mental health, there are policy levers, there are programmatic levers, and there are cultural levers. You know, yes, it is true that from a policy perspective, we need to invest more in primary care, absolutely. We need to train more mental health providers. We need to make sure insurance companies actually reimburse adequately for mental health care. We've got to use telemedicine more extensively and make the authorities to, uh, to provide telemedicine across state lines permanent. We need to do that. We need to address uh, social media by creating actual safety standards like we did for motor vehicles decades ago to help reduce motor vehicle fatalities. We need to ensure we're investing in social emotional learning in our schools so kids have a foundation for building healthy relationships. Those are all policy and programmatic things that we can and should do. And that includes investing in the organizations that used to bring us together. There's been a decline over the last half century in our participation in recreational leagues, service organizations, religious organizations, and others that used to bring us together. But the, the piece I, I like want to share with you before we end is the, the cultural piece here as well. Because the crisis that we are experiencing right now, I do not believe is fundamentally a policy crisis or a programmatic crisis. I actually think it's a moral crisis that we're living in. I talk to so many Americans who say to me, Vivek, you know, it feels like it's become more important to be right than to be compassionate. That's become somehow more important to be powerful than to be kind, to look good than to actually be good. And that sense has fueled this notion, this belief almost, that people have now taken on that fundamentally we're just mean-spirited, that we're just looking out for ourselves, that this is just the way the world is, and so we've got to be that way if we want to survive in this kind of world. But I actually don't believe that's fundamentally who we are. I don't think that we are primarily mean-spirited and unkind. I think we are actually 
more grounded in the core values of kindness and generosity, of service and friendship. I think that's what we want. That's, I think, the life we want our kids to lead. Uh, and I believe that because that's actually how I feel about my own kids. I had a bit of a crisis in 2016 uh, when we found out that um, the, in 20, if, and she, yeah, beginning of 2016 when we found out that we were expecting our first child. Uh, I was thrilled. I was so excited. I, was, I, I wanted to be a dad for a long time. But what I also realized was that 2016 was a year when our country was going through a lot. You may remember there, was, there were so many acts of violence. There were, uh, there were race, you know, riots and marches that were happening because of, uh, you know, of, of young black uh, men and boys who had been shot and killed. Uh, there, was, there was an election going on that year and political polarization felt like it was at an all-time high. We didn't know what was to come in the years after. There was a lot happening that made the world feel cold and uninviting and harsh. And I asked myself the question as a soon-to-be dad, what kind of world am I bringing my son into? Is he going to be received well? Are people going to give him the benefit of the doubt even if he uses the wrong word or says the wrong thing? Are they going to lift him up when he falls down as we all inevitably will? Uh, Are they going to welcome him even though he may have darker colored skin and a funny sounding name like his dad? Are they going to see him for, for who he is, not for the labels that he may hold? These are the questions I had, and I don't fully know the answers to those questions. But what I do know is that what I need to do, and what my wife needs to do, and what I hope all of us will do, is use every bit of influence we have through our actions, through how we treat each other, through the programs that we advocate for, to the leaders that we support and choose, to the programs that we build, Use all of that influence to help create a world that's fueled by love and not by fear. Because a world fueled by love is a world where we're kind to each other, where we're generous. It's a world where we value friendships, where we're not looking to build connections just because we're thinking, hey, what can that person do for me tomorrow? But we realize that we are truly are better off and stronger when we're together. And we can model that in our lives. And when we do it, we do something that my old mentor, Rachel Remen, told me, taught me long ago. She said, Vivek, when you stand in strength, you allow others to see you and to come together around the light. And each of us has the power to be that light. You know, I, I really believe in something I came to realize through the practice of medicine, that we heal not just through the medicines we prescribe and the procedures that we do. We heal through the love that we give and the love that we receive. And when you realize that, you realize that we're all healers. This is a time when the world needs more healers. Uh, And the most, for those of you who are in medical school or in nursing school or in training to be a healthcare professional, the most important tools you need to be a healer are the ones that you had before you came to school. It's that ability to be kind, to be generous, to give and to receive love. So that is a moral reawakening that we have to engineer together in our country. It's how we stitch together the social fabric of our nation. And on that foundation, we can build healthy institutions. We can choose leaders who are grounded in those values and look out for not just some of us, but for all of us. We can make the investments in schools, even if we don't have kids, because we recognize it's important for all of us. We can invest in home care, for folks who are struggling to take care of elderly relatives with Alzheimer's and disabilities, even if we don't have those relatives at home because we know that the struggling and suffering of others matters to us. We can invest in getting homeless people the care and the housing they need because even if we have resources, we know if they are suffering, that means that we are not well as a community. That is what we can do when we are guided by the right values. That is what a society looks like that's grounded in the right values and all of us can be beacons for those kind of values. We can be ex- lead by example. We can call for that kind of change. And if we do that, then I believe that we can ultimately create the kind of world that I want for my son and for my daughter, that I want for all of our kids and for our grandkids, for all of us who are here in the room and those who are not here, which is a world where people feel that they belong, where they know that they matter, and they recognize that, yes, well, we can go fast alone, But if we truly want to go far, if we truly want to build things that will last, if we truly want to lift up everyone, we have to move together.
I think we should leave it there. What do, what do you think? <laughs> we, we, we didn't get to, um, to cover social media, so you can give Dr. Adams, who's on Twitter like all the time, some <laughs> up advice in the green room. <laughs> but hey, once more, how about a warm thank you to the Surgeon General. Thank you, Dr. Murthy and all of our distinguished panelists for being here today, and to Dr. Gupta for moderating such a dynamic session. I know we will keep this in our minds and hearts at Dartmouth and work to create the kinds of communities that you talked about. Uh, you've given us so much to think about, and we wanted to thank you for spending time with us today and really commemorate this historic occasion. I'm so pleased that we're presenting all of you with the C. Everett Koop Legacy Medal. These medals, specially commissioned for each of you, represent the gratitude we feel for your service to the country and for our shared commitment to mobilizing around health and wellness. Beautiful. And it's our sincere, sincere hope that these medals will be a reminder of our willing and able partnership as we take on this important crisis and work to support our young people and all of those in our country and the world. Thank you to all of you. Finally, Dr. McBride, we wanted to present you with the medal as well on behalf of Dartmouth for your support in making this occasion happen together. We're so pleased to do it. We have it for you, I promise. <laughs> and to all of those who joined us in the audience and the thousands of you watching the streaming, thank you for being part of this. Um, we're so excited to push forward on the important work ahead and to support all of us in our mental health journey. Thank you. Thank you.